Welcome to a tech moment on Cannabis Tech. I'm your host, Christina Etter. In this podcast, we take just a few minutes to talk about the exciting science and technology that's changing and impacting the cannabis and hemp industries. And once in a while, I get to have a special guest on the podcast to talk about some of the nuances of the cannabis industry and and how far we've actually come. Now, In the world of cannabis, there are many self-proclaimed experts, and there's a broad range of skill sets. But my guest today is the grandfather of the American cannabis industry and one of the most influential voices throughout the history of legalization. Given the name Guru of Ganja by High Times Magazine back in the 1980s, since the late 60s, Ed Rosenthal has steadily gained fame as a political agitator, and I absolutely love that word, political agitator, activist and expert. And in 1999, he was deputized by the city of Oakland and was in charge of cultivating starter plants so that patients could grow their own cannabis following the 1996 passage of Prop 215. And for decades now, Ed has been on the forefront of the movement to make marijuana not only accessible, but acceptable. Believing that everyone should be able to grow cannabis, Ed graciously shares his expertise. As author and editor of more than a dozen books on marijuana cultivation and social policy, with a total sales of over one million books, Ed's new book, Cannabis Grower's Handbook, demystifies the cannabis plant, making it easy for anybody to grow at home for their own use. But then he also gives advice for how to get started in the business or even improve your established cannabis operation. So welcome to the show, Mr. Rosenthal. It is an absolute pleasure and honor to have you here on my show today. It's a pleasure to be with you. So I'm, I'm thrilled and I can't wait to hear more from you. But before we get into the new book, I want to take just a couple of steps back and take a walk through time a little bit with you. Now, you've been a pioneer in this industry for a long time. So I would love to kind of hear your perspective on what are some of the biggest changes really that you've seen over the years that's kind of helped legalization move forward and progress? Well, I think the biggest change has been the acceptance of cannabis now by uh, the vast majority of society. And when the first uh, uh, surveys were done, only about a third of the population thought that marijuana should be legal. So it was a uphill, 50 year uphill battle to uh, change people's perceptions. And with a change of perception came the change in laws. So that, that that's, I think that's the biggest thing that it went from being uh, anathema to society and uh, a gateway drug to being uh, a product that was considered essential during uh, the pandemic. Right. And wasn't that an amazing transition, right? That was just, uh, I think all of us were a little... uh, little surprised by that designation when when it all came out. And, you know, it it really has been amazing to kind of see that perspective shift. I'll tell you, I grew up in Iowa, Iowa, when I was when I was younger, I mean, it was marijuana was highly demonized and it's still not um, very well accepted in in a lot of states like that and but it has been very interesting as i myself have gotten out and gone to different places across the united states to see how those perspectives really have shifted and how they're changing i'm curious what do you think some of the biggest influence have been to kind of stimulate that shift in perception in in consumers and and in the legal sense as well i think it's been familiarity uh that uh once people started using it medically and their friends and neighbors and their uh, relatives saw that the people weren't going crazy and weren't dysfunctional it gained more and more acceptance and the fact that people could be using it for years and years and still remain functional uh, changed the rest of society's perceptions of it. Right. You know, and I think a lot of that comes from 
in recent years in particular, I think more people have been open to talking about the fact that they they do use cannabis or, you know, they may have this great, uh, you know, high profile corporate role. But then when they admit to their friends that, oh, by the way, I smoke cannabis on the weekends or at night instead of having a, a glass of wine or a beer or a mixed drink. You know, I think it's those kinds of perceptions, really, that uh, or those, those kinds of situations that help change those perceptions. I know at least that's what happened for me. I was I was a young, naive kid in Iowa, and, and my company sent me out to San Francisco, and, and my mind was blown because uh, you know I I had grown up believing that you couldn't be both. You couldn't be a productive um, citizen and smoke cannabis. And then when I went to San Francisco, I saw absolutely that that's not what it was. And so that's really what kind of helped open my eyes. And I'm, I'm hoping now that as cannabis legalization is spreading across the nation, that you're right, that other people are starting to see that these very well-respected members in their communities do use cannabis. And uh, perhaps the richest man in the world, Musk, he, you know, Elon Musk, he's either the first or second richest person in the world, and he smoked it on a uh, podcast. So, uh, obviously it didn't, it didn't uh, affect his success in life in terms of uh, uh, being able to earn a living. Right, and hopefully there's a lot more of us that are able to... Um portray that image as well you know now that the the veil is kind of lifting and and it's not so taboo anymore to talk about cannabis now you have been writing about cannabis for decades and and you know i gotta tell you i actually have i have my husband's copy of high times from 1984 and uh, one of your columns is in here so it was fun for me to go back and and read through this and I found it interesting too. What a what a coinky dink that uh, this is this tech or this magazine was about tech. And since we're a tech publication, I would absolutely love to hear your thoughts from you know back in 1984 and before. You know, tech really has kind of helped I think change and evolve the cannabis industry. So I'd love to hear your perspective on these changes. And and is technology for better or for worse in cannabis these days? Uh, well, there's been a, a major change in uh, technology in uh, the world over the past uh, 30 years. Uh, as an example, peop when people first started growing indoors, they were using fluorescent lights. And then it went to uh, the HID lights, such as metal halides and high-pressure sodium lamps. And now people are using LEDs. And that's a tremendous cost saving in terms of energy because more of the light that's produced by LEDs is used by the plants than uh, HID lights. So that's one example of it. And also uh, people are more concerned about uh, botanical issues like uh, vapor pressure deficit, which wasn't even in the vocabulary 30 years ago. And a lot of this has to do with the change in technology in, in agriculture in general, but a lot of it is people going from a hobby to a, more of a business model and having more training. So it's a combination of the, the, that agriculture in itself has advanced and then people becoming more familiar with it. And that's both indoors and outdoors. Right. And, you know, the one thing that I can certainly hope for that, that we've seen a lot of movement on here recently is that they are lifting the veil finally, I think, on research and they're starting to open up a few more avenues for us to be able to finally put that qualified research behind the things that we've been saying for decades. And and I think, too, as, as we start to learn more about the plant and learn more about how it grows, we're going to see technologies like these, like you said, the vapor pressure deficits and, and uh, you know, adding the CO2 and, and, and doing all these things to really improve conditions and keep those environmental consistencies right and the grow. I, I think it's just going to be amazing what we learn over the next several years. Well, certainly we're going to learn more about uh, using light even more efficiently than we're using it now, and different methods of growing plant, uh, be 
bigger, better plants sooner and uh, and quicker. But ultimately, I think that um, uh, a lot of the industry is going to have a dramatic change in that a lot of the uh, material that's used for concentrates that's now grown as a, in marijuana plants, a lot of that technology will be transferred to yeast and so that people will actually brew THC rather than grow it. And uh, the, the advantages of brewing it is that the process takes four or five days and is as simple as uh, sh sugar water in a tank, but which is basically how beer is made. And then, then that would, will be refined. And so that you would, you'll be able to get specific, uh, uh, specific cannabinoids or specific terpenes and then combine them in different recipes. And so that, I think that's going to, that's going to be, be, at least as far as concentrates and extractions go, that's going to leave uh, agriculture behind. Right. Now, I, I am curious, since you, since you bring that up, I would love to hear your perspective on that as, as a pioneer in the industry that, that fought so hard for legalization and for the ability to grow cannabis. What is your perspective on things like biosynthesized cannabinoids and, and some of these things that we're seeing start to enter the market today? So uh, there are a lot of different ways of looking at it, but uh, you know, science in itself uh, isn't the issue. The issue is policy. So let's say, uh, let's say that uh, a yeast was developed that produced uh, a particular THC, let's say Delta 9. Now, if that yeast was uh, available to the public, then anybody could brew it. How however, if it was held e either in a proprietary some proprietary method or some uh, uh, proprietary schedule or else illegal, kept illegal, then uh, that would, uh, th that, that's a policy decision rather than a scientific one. But it would certainly be easier for the average person to, to brew a, uh, to brew some THC rather than to grow it. To grow it, you need lights and electricity and uh, you know, t specific temperatures and humidity. And to brew it, you ba basically have water, yeast uh, in, a in a sterile solution, yeast in a sterile water solution. And then four or five days later, you would be able to uh, refine it in, in some way. And, and I'm sure those techniques will, will be uh, re re refined as well. And so uh, that would be much easier for the average uh, user than uh, setting up a light system or growing it in the backyard. And it would certainly be much faster. Now, let's say the, uh, as a consumer, you had a choice of di different terpenes and different cannabinoids, and you could make your own recipe of uh, your own THC or a cannabinoid recipe uh, using um, uh, different yeasts that have that uh, that, uh, that that produce different THCs or different terpenes. So I, I think that's a bright future. It yeah yeah people will go from growers to brewers. Yeah, that's fascinating science, right? Interesting, so interesting. It's just going to be. Uh, you know, the next several years in the cannabis industry, I think, is, is going to be fascinating to see how everything kind of evolves. Now, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was that in this particular magazine um, that my husband had, there were, you had a column in there, your Ask Ed column, and you discuss the differences between indica and sativa as we knew it back in 1984. And at that time, you felt like the market was very indica driven and that many commercial sativas really didn't have much of a positive outlook. I'm curious now, fast forward, you know, 30 some years, what's your perspective on the market today in terms of, of cannabis products and those variances in, in the different cultivars? 
there's been a change in how people uh, how people grow and uh, what they can grow. So in uh, in uh, the southern tier of the United States, Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, going down to Florida, sativas are an excellent choice because uh, when grown outdoors, with the short days, they'll they'll uh, come in and flower. So I think that that the limitations of growing uh, illegally uh, are no longer uh, part of the culture. So we have more of a choice of what to grow. And a lot of it depends on the area that you're in. If, if you were to try to grow some indicas down south, they'd immediately start to flower as soon as they germinated because of the short days. And so uh, uh, sativas or sativa hybrids will do better in uh, in the southern tier of the of the U.S. On the other hand, um, if you try to grow sativas in in the northern climes, uh, they uh, they'd be frozen before they uh, before they were ripe and mature. So people have a lot of choices depending on where they live and whether they're growing indoors or outdoors. And certainly there are a lot more varieties, so that you can find a variety that's ideal for both your mind and for the growth pattern. Definitely, and that's that's a learning curve we learned ourselves. I live at 8,200 feet, and sativas don't don't do well out here. <laughs> uh, our our winters come far too soon. So, <clears throat> so I'm curious with this column. Uh, ask Ed. Do you do you still write a column like this, or is there somewhere that the audience can go to read your advice online? I give a lot of advice on edrosenthal.com. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm not really doing the column right now. And, uh, you know, for the past 15 months, I was writing, I was involved in writing a Cannabis Grower's Handbook. And that was a full-time, uh, full-time occupation. And so uh, I might get back to the column, but I like, uh, I like the, 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 uh, forum that I have in at at, at, at the site edrosenthal.com. Perfect. And that's actually a fantastic segue into my next question, because I want to talk about your new book. And one of the things that I found interesting in here is that you're not just writing to the home grower, but you actually have some advice and some tips and tricks in there for people that are looking to start a business or maybe even some commercial growers. So tell me a little bit about this latest book and and what's the motivation behind the update? Well, you wouldn't use a 10-year-old computer book because uh, there's been so many advances in in uh, the industry, in both computers and everything that results from that. And the same thing is, has happened with, the cannab- with cannabis. First of all, we've learned a lot more about the plant, and we've learned a lot more about how to grow it. And there's been a lot more uh, technology uh, that has been invented relating to that, both to the growth and the processing. And so uh, right now, Marijuana Growers Handbook is 10 years old. So it was written about 12 years ago. And uh, so it, so a person who's using it might have been eight years old when the book was written. And uh, I think thought people deserve to, to know the most modern techniques and the best processes and take advantage of all of the knowledge that's been built up over the last 10 years. And so to that end, I realized that it was more than one person could do, or I guess one person could do it, but it would be much more difficult. And I engaged uh, Rob, Dr. Rob Flannery, who has a degree, a PhD in plant biology and who ha- has Dr. Rob Farms, which is a, a marijuana growing facility. And, uh, my old associate, my associate from the first book, Ange- uh, Angela Baca, who has uh, uh, has been in the 
writing about cannabis and been involved in the cannabis industry for the last 12 years. And so the three of us uh, collaborated on this book with uh, different uh, uh, teachers, professors, uh, PhDs, as well as uh, people in the industry to put this book together. And so it was a great collaboration. There were dozens of, uh, not co-authors, but contributors that were involved in this. And we think that it's a really comprehensive book. So we hope that the goal of the book is to help people grow the best marijuana the easiest possible way. And we think that we will be helping a lot of people to do that. Most definitely. I just heard that, uh, I, I just did an interview a couple of days ago, that Virginia now is going to start to allow personal cultivation while they ramp up their adult use uh, laws and whatnot. How important do you feel that it is that consumers are able to grow their own cannabis? And do you feel like home grows have any impact on the cannabis market, the commercial cannabis market at all? Well, they're in so many ways because, uh, uh, well, let's just take the tomato industry. You know that there are multinational corporations grow, who are involved in that industry and big farmers and small farmers, and it gets down to neighbor-to-neighbor -to -neighbor exchanges for, over tomatoes. And uh, uh, one of the reasons why tomatoes, it, it's so... Uh, uh, why that tomato growing is so popular is because when you buy a store-bought tomato, it's picked way before it's ripe, and it never has a chance to develop all the flavors and sugars that a, a vine-ripened tomato has. And you have sort of the same thing with, with marijuana. And there is no nothing as good as fresh marijuana that has been... Uh, that has been properly dried and cured. And um, so, and there's a tremendous pleasure in growing marijuana. Uh, uh, in my book, I present a warning that uh, using marijuana may not be addictive, but growing it is. And uh, there are a lot of reasons why people like to grow marijuana and why some people continue growing marijuana even after they stop using it. And some of those are that, uh, unlike tomatoes, which have, for instance, which have a different trajectory where they start growing and then they start growing fruit and they continue to grow and to grow fruit, a cannabis plant has distinct stages of life, sort of like mammals and, and humans, that it has a growth stage, it has a germination stage, a growth stage, and then it goes into maturity and flowering and reproductive stage. And that's and then it's an annual plant and it dies after reproducing. And that's sort of like the human trajectory. And so uh, people personify marijuana a lot. And marijuana plants are very individualistic so that they... And, uh, and the uh, also... The fact that the it's a female plant that is productive for humans and that is considered the more beautiful plant than the male plant, and in a lot of human life and uh, in art, uh, the female is is uh, depicted much more than males are uh, as an object of beauty. So, so the and since uh, a high high percentage of uh, Growers are male, perhaps seventy percent. So there's that uh, sort of sexual thing in there, as well as life trajectory and the fact that each plant is individualistic, and uh, you get uh, people who get really into that, just like that. Other people will get into growing giant pumpkins. Remember that growing marijuana is very addictive. That's a warning should that should be on every pack of seed. Yeah, yeah, no, I love that. And, you know, it, it, out here, it's, um, 
you often hear people that are that are growing their own they they often refer to them as the girls or you know they they always you're right they personify their plants and they they absolutely give them personality and and it's it's definitely a um you're right it's fun it, it's fun to grow them and it's definitely a a nice hobby and i can absolutely see where people would become addicted to growing but one of the things that I want to touch on is that your book isn't just for the home grower, though. You do touch on some more of the entre entrepreneurial side of the cannabis industry. So I'm just curious, can you tell us what someone might expect if they want to pick up this book and, and learn more about getting involved in the cannabis industry? Well, first, first of all, the book assumes that you know nothing about plants and nothing about growing plants and nothing about marijuana. And so it starts, uh, the book starts off by describing cannabis and uh, its growth patterns and then goes into how to grow it. And the conditions that a plant needs are the same whether it's being grown commercially or as a hobby. The plant itself needs the same conditions. What's different is how those conditions are provided. And so uh, we try to go start with the simplest methods of, of a particular technique and then uh, from that simplicity develop a little bit more complexity. And people can drop off wherever they, they want and still and grow a great crop or they could go more deeply into it if they wish and they'll uh and they'll have mat material that will be of interest to the commercial grower but whether you're growing a single plant or acres those plants need the same conditions so that's that's the basis of the book it's about how to provide those conditions for the plant Fantastic. Yeah. And I, I can tell you from experience, too, that sometimes, you know, when you're when you're just learning, a lot of that stuff's kind of trial and error. So I, I can absolutely see we're having a book like yours to, you know, kind of guide you through some of those things that, that can happen when you're first learning how to grow cannabis would be extraordinarily valuable. Um, now, our audience, most of our audience anyway, is, you know, fairly invested in the industry. They're pretty involved. I'm just curious, you've been involved in this for a long time. What do you see in your crystal ball? What do you think the future holds for the cannabis industry, say, in 10 years, 15 years? Well, cannabis is a very unique plant, and it has a very unique chemistry. And first of all, I think that a lot of the chemist cannabis chemistry will be used in medicine and uh, in different ways, ways that we're not even aware of. And for instance, right as we're speaking, there's a conference going on called the International Can Cannabinoid Research Society, and they're having their annual convention. It's virtual this year. But in there, that it's mostly PhDs who are talking about um, cannabis chemistry and its interaction with humans. And I think as we learn more about that, more and more uh, different parts uh, or different cannabinoids will be used in medically. And then as far as recreation goes, uh, I see two things happening. One is that uh, uh, people will develop more uh, different combinations of cannabinoids and terpenes that will provide different, more specific effects. So you might have some that are recreational and, you know, it's just for hanging out or lazing around or thinking or socializing. And then some uh, will be uh, for specific things like going to sleep. Uh, you know, and sleep is a big issue. So uh, I think that some of the chemistry, we'll, we'll find that some of the chemistry is really advantageous for uh, helping people sleep and uh, regulate their uh, circadian rhythm. So uh, I, th I see a bright future for it. And, uh, and I see it both, it, I see it developing more like the tomato model than people would think because we're going to have both uh, 
very uh, scientific production. For instance, we have scientific production of tomatoes, and still more people grow tomatoes. Uh, more uh, consumers and uh, hobbyists grow tomatoes than all the commercial tomatoes in the U.S. So home growers are growing more tomatoes than commercial growers. And I think ultimately we're going to see a lot of that, uh, uh, more of that, uh, especially since um, to, to, since uh, uh, marijuana has a high value, that that might be the most productive crop a hobbyist could grow. Right. Yeah, it's definitely proving to be a pretty lucrative crop, especially in terms of of agriculture and and agricultural uh, markets. It's definitely you know the the top ring in terms of of being so lucrative. But if someone is kind of sitting on the fence right now, and and maybe they're thinking about growing their own, or maybe they're looking for a new career path, and they're wanting to get involved in the cannabis industry, what's your advice for somebody that that's kind of on the outside looking? Looking in right now and, and just kind of curious? Well, it depends on the legality. So uh, in California, it's pretty much legal to grow, especially indoors. Um, we have a county by county fractionalization so that some counties don't allow legal cultivation. I mean, uh, outdoor cultivation. But if you're in California, there's not a repercussion for growing. But in some states, uh, where it's illegal, people have to take into account are they, if if they sh uh, should uh, interact with the law, wh what's re what's the uh, uh, re uh, the uh, danger reward ratio there? So uh, re you know risk reward ratio in growing. But let's say. You, um, there wasn't uh, a, uh, a legal reason not to grow, then I'd highly advise people to get uh, go into it as long as they have the realization that growing is very addictive, that once you grow... There are so many people that I know that can't be without growing plants. So, uh, so I take that seriously, that... Uh, you're going to get a, have a lifelong hobby when you start growing. So uh, it's very pleasurable, too. And uh, uh, watching plants grow and being around living plants is, is part of being human. You know, uh, part of the reason why people like pets so much is that in, uh, in a more primitive life, we were always around animals. We ascribe different uh, personalities to animals, like the sneaky fox, the wise coyote, you know, things like that. And, and with these plants, cannabis uh, has been associated with humans for so long, in some, uh, probably in some uh, uh, societies, it was the first or the only plant being grown that. Uh, we have a special relationship with that plant and it's very fulfilling to grow it. It definitely is a rewarding crop for sure. Whether you use it or not, it's still rewarding to grow that plant. It's, it's fun to watch it mature. Um, so finally, I mean, if someone is ready to grow and they want your advice, how do they go about getting your book? Uh, well, it's in bookstore. Uh, Marijuana Growers Handbook is in bookstores all over the country and it's also available on the internet really easily. And uh, they, they could go to my site and uh, get a copy with uh, my signature on it. So uh, uh, there, it's, it's easily accessible. Fantastic. Well, we're definitely looking forward to seeing that new book and uh, hopefully it does does really well. And it's, it's just so much fun to have you here on the show and, and to have this conversation and get your expertise. It, it's, it's absolutely been a joy to have you here. Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate being here and uh, uh, it's a great show and uh, it's fun, isn't it? It's absolutely a blast. Talking about marijuana is fun too. <laughs> <laughs> it most certainly is. It most certainly is. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for having me.